Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. First of all, a very sincere uh, apology for uh, getting a bit late. And welcome to Canada India Foundation's virtual webinar speaker series. Thank you all for joining. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is continuing learning amid global pandemic. We have a very special guest today, Honorable Stephen Lecce, Ontario's Minister of Education. Welcome, Minister. Friends, we are passing through a very tough time of COVID-19 pandemic. Education sector is facing the biggest challenge. The pandemic compelled the governments across the globe to make changes to their systems in a very short span of time to continue the education with safe environment for kids. As we know that over 2 million students studying in around 4,000 elementary and 1,000 secondary schools in Ontario, and they need a special care and attention during this pandemic to continue their education without any interruption. Minister has been a person in action he has been announcing various initiatives to augment schools with various resources to aid uninterrupted learning. And we are looking forward to this engaging discussion to learn more on this. And before that, let me invite Mr. Ritesh Malik, the National Convener of Canada India Foundation to formally introduce the minister. Ritesh, over to you. Uh, good evening, friends, and very warm welcome to you all. I have been asked to introduce a man who needs no introduction in Ontario. Man on the hot seat, as we all like to call him these days. Honorable Stephen Lecce is the Minister of Education for the province of Ontario and the member of provincial parliament uh, for King Vaughan, which also happens to be my home riding. As a minister, Stephen is continuously and tirelessly working for student success and is transforming education policy to build an education system that is equipped to support our next generation in ever-changing economic landscape. It is his mission to ensure that students are given every opportunity to develop the transferable skills needed to lead productive lives and secure good jobs. Stephen stands for an inclusive and equitable system of education and believes that our future as a province and as a country depends on unlocking the potential of all youth. At this young age, prior to this responsibility, as Minister of Education for Ontario, Stephen has served as a chief spokesperson for former Prime Minister Right Honorable Stephen Harper, as Deputy Government House Leader, the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Infrastructure, and the Parliamentary Assistant to the Premier. And this is just the beginning of his political life. Over to you, my friend, Stephen. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Ritesh. Uh, thank you, Satish. Thank you all for the incredible opportunity to speak to the Canada India Foundation. Uh, I'm very proud of the work you do in building bridges, uh, in expanding trade, in creating opportunities for young people, and in keeping your membership a very proud, dynamic, hardworking Indo-Canadian diaspora in this country, keeping us connected uh, during the pandemic. And so uh, I've been privileged to work with the CIF uh, going back to my days working for Prime Minister Harper, uh, really working collaboratively in the context of building up our relationships with uh, the government of India and Ontario and Canada because of the tremendous economic opportunity. But beyond the financials is also a recognition of our shared value, uh, our Commonwealth heritage, uh, the largest democracy in the world, a pioneering uh, country that is enterprising in virtually every field of human endeavor. And it's not just about the good work being done in India. I'm particularly, or I'm proud of the work that Indo-Canadians are doing in this country. Um, and I'm proud to know many of them. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Ritesh, who has been uh, a good friend and mentor, but most importantly, uh, a solid entrepreneur who is constantly reminding me about the importance of building bridges uh, with our Indian friends and with Indian Canadians, Indo-Canadians, uh, who I think uh, are really making a difference. I also want to recognize that we're in the middle of a pandemic. This hasn't been easy on any of us, and I'm not, uh, I know we're on the, your foundation, and I'm sure in your own homes, small businesses, your own places of work, talk about a time to be alive. What are the common themes through this pandemic that we draw parallels in education? First is it has been a time of disruption. 
the impact of COVID-19 on our mental health, on our productivity, on our supply chain, uh, and really on the ability of people to carry on their work has never been more uh, disrupted. And I think the lesson as we applied in education is yes, the challenges are immense. Uh, Ritesh said uh, on the hot seat, the, the concept of always having to be to pivot to respond to deal with these emerging challenges and risks, often that you have no notice for. But I think the constant thread is how we adapt, innovate, and really embrace change. Um, when we look throughout our history as a country, some of the greatest forms of development and innovation have come from periods of duress and difficulty. And in amongst this pandemic, we have seen an incredible resolve and unity of spirit in this country and in this province, um, led by people like you, Indo-Canadians who have been generous, compassionate, uh, and patriotic. And I just want to start off with a recognition of gratitude because, you know, look, we're in a period of challenge. The globe is facing uncertainty, darkness all around us. You know, you look to the U.S. with a great sense of concern. You look to other jurisdictions in the world, and yet there is light in this darkness, and it is literally our province, and I'd argue our country, where we are doing some things right. Uh, and I think what brings a great sense of comfort for me is I say this as a progressive conservative, but the fact that our premier is working so well with our prime minister, different political persuasions, very different ideological positions, uh, they may not agree on a lot, but what they do agree on is we're on one team, Team Canada, and we're gonna stand up every day to make sure we get through this from an economic perspective, a human health perspective, a mental health perspective. And I'm not sure we could talk, we could point to many countries in the world where that is the case, that unity of purpose is what overrides us, not politics, but country over party. And that I think is something that brings a great sense of, um, of comfort to me. Now today, I'm really here to speak in part about how this pandemic has had a impact on education and how we've lived up to the principles and values that I think the Indo-Canadian community have represented every step of the way through this pandemic. You have innovated, you have adapted. And I think in many respects, you have embraced change as difficult as change is for so many of us. And I wanna draw parallels to what we're doing in the Ministry of Education. I work in a government, uh, as uh, noted, I, uh, I am the youngest Minister of Education. I was when I was appointed uh, in Ontario's history. That in itself, I mean, it may be interesting to some, but that's not in itself a proof positive that I'm a good minister of education. I just have to be a young minister of education. How you measure my success or failures is according to my action. And in the past 14 months, we have taken decisive action to ensure that parents, taxpayers, and students are in the driver's seat. The you, the people who pay the bills, who work hard, play by the rules, that you have a voice in how we build up our education system, how we educate our children, how we hire our teachers, and how we promote them within our system. And I'm very proud, and I'm uh, unapologetically uh, proud to stand up for the values of parents through this process. Now, I started in a difficult time. It was the negotiations 14 months ago. I would pretend to suggest from a personal perspective and a leadership perspective, it, was, it felt like being thrown into the deep end. Some, and it's a binary choice, either you sink or you swim. And I think in leadership, what I'm appreciating most is in the greatest difficulties in one's life, the greatest moments of adversity, we are tested. And I would argue we are today as a country and as a people in the context of COVID. And when we got tested last March, we acted quickly when we started to see significant transmission risk of COVID-19. I closed schools, the first in Canada to do so. It's what we did after. It's not difficult to close schools in the abstract. Um, it's how you reopen them and how you pivot and how you embrace change and innovation within our system. And I wanna to speak to you about a few things that matter most to me. The first is my aspiration. I aspire to build a province that is the global leader in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. We have an abundant uh, level of human capital, of people, our greatest talent, our greatest resource, notwithstanding our mineral deposits and. Uh, incredible access to natural resources. It is our people that is our greatest strength. It is a highly skilled workforce. In, in fact, one of the most skilled workforces in the OECD. 
That's not by coincidence. It's because we incentivize young people of all demographics, all faith and heritage and income and uh, orientation, place of birth. It doesn't matter. We want young people to succeed. We want them to know that in this country, they can get ahead. And so when we look at our aspiration, I want to make sure that young people have the skills to succeed in a modern competitive global economy. And colleagues, when you look at the data, um, you know, where you have roughly twice the rate of youth unemployment, where you have a debt to GDP for millennials at roughly 100% debt to income, for example, as a comparator, there is a clear problem, a problem that all parties can point to, but we now have to fix because it's unfair. You know, when I look at my parents, um, you know, a very similar story, I'm sure, to many of you. They came here in a post-war reality seeking economic opportunity. They came here not having any language, um, no money, no friends in Canada. They came here with the greatest currency known to mankind, which is hope, determination, uh, and a, and a sort of a, a, a flame that was lit within them to do better because they wanted their children to have the opportunities they couldn't imagine for themselves. And when you think of that sacrifice, my parents, like perhaps you or your parents, come into this country, and yet, one generation later, so many of my peers, so many of my friends, you know, in their 20s and 30s and even in their 40s, are not able to achieve the dream of this country of working hard, getting a job, uh, you know, having, uh, uh, being able to raise a family and own a home and retiring with dignity, that continuum. I think for many years in this province and country has been under threat. And we think, how is that acceptable? How is it possible in the one of the most, in the most prosperous democratic societies and free societies, the young people's, the dream that has lived within the hearts and minds of our people is sort of, in some respects, for some people, they feel it is dying. And my responsibility, yes, as a generational voice in cabinet and uh, perhaps a younger person within government, is to make sure that those voices, that they are heard, and that we do everything humanly possible to inspire the next generation of workers and innovators and entrepreneurs, of thinkers and doers, to never lose that, that burning flame, that, that, that the flame eternal, um, to continue to try to work and to succeed in this country. And when I go, when I talk about STEM education, I argue it is the central common denominator that could help young people succeed in addition to the soft skills, in addition to the changes we're making through the pandemic uh, of emphasizing STEM, emphasizing qualities like emotional intelligence. We also believe we need to ensure that our young people have technological fluency. They understand how to use technology in order to embrace the platform and ultimately, um, you know, um, make it part of their career. And so what have we done through this pandemic? Well, most would suggest, look, your focus needs to be on the health and safety of children. I agree, it has been. But I would argue leadership, and I would submit a dynamic element of leadership is to be able to do multiple things at once, to achieve the proactive while also responding to the issues of the day that are happening around us. And I really feel strongly that I'm not going to react only to COVID. We have a job, a forward planning agenda to ensure your child gets ahead. So in June, I announced a new math curriculum in the province of Ontario. It hasn't been announced uh, or updated in 15 years. YouTube didn't exist the last time we updated our math curriculum. The world has changed. Innovation has changed. The words AI, you know, and automated intelligence didn't even exist within the verbiage of our curriculum 15 years ago. And that's not a comment on the politicians of the past. It's just, it's a different world. And the responsibility of government is, of course, to make sure that our curriculum, that, that the content that we're teaching our kids is aligned to the labor market needs of our country. And the mismatch that existed was having young people being trained for jobs that do not exist. And yet we have massive shortage, shortages of employment in Ontario and in Canada. So my, my aim when we unveiled this math curriculum was to do three principal things. Uh, the first was to ensure that we emphasize financial literacy, which is so important to young people to know how to build uh, household budgets, how to balance their budgets, how to live within their means, um, and also just how to appreciate debts and the concepts uh, of debt and credit, which are very important, especially when you look at the debt levels of young people. The second is we mandated coding, 
every single student in this province effective this September will know starting in grade one through grade eight every year without exception how to code. We'll be one of two provinces in Canada to do it. We are giving Ontario youth, Ontario youth a competitive advantage and I am proud of that. And the third is we have ensured within our math curriculum a, an emphasis on social emotional learning, really a mental health element that's trying to encourage young people that it's okay to fail, to try again, to build resiliency and to help them understand that you know, in math and as it applies in other STEM disciplines, um, that having the internal confidence to keep moving through the material is a strength. We lead this country. We are introducing financial literacy and coding uh, and numeracy skills at the earliest levels. There is no province doing it in grade one. And I'm proud to lead in this respect, even among a pandemic. And the question fundamentally part of tonight's a series is a discussion about what are the lessons learned and how we can embrace change amid this uh, disruption. And I would argue uh, we need to continuously be driving forward an agenda of change and improvement. And that's the basis for our math curriculum. It's the basis for my dream, my, my vision uh, of an Ontario where we literally, and I mean this, it's not sort of a talking point. This is what I, my goal is as your Minister of Education. It's to solidify this province as a leader in STEM education. Now, part of STEM, the, the T representing technology, is about understanding how to use that platform, how to use technology, how to be technologically fluent, as we say. And I believe, and I have believed that for those that have been following my um, career or for those that have not, but turn on CP24 and you may see me from time to time, I think what I'd say to you is you will know I have been a strong principled defender of online learning. Now, not because I believe it should replace the in-class experience, but I, because I believe you, the parent, should have the choice. Most of you will choose to put your kids in class. According to the statistics, overwhelmingly you did. The 70, 75, 80% of children are in class. But I believe in choice. And I believe in enabling a parent to make the decision, not a bureaucrat, not a politician, and not a union leader. You should be in the driver's seat of your decisions of your children. And I trust your judgment over anyone in government. And that's why uh, we provided a credible online learning process. Now, remember, we fought hard to codify online learning. I believe in my heart that online learning, providing a digital embrace of learning, using this type of technology, Zoom-style technology, to make it live, dynamic, synchronous, um, I think is something that could revolutionize education. Now, we're the only province, and I'm proud to be your minister that has delivered a program, and I will be very frank with you, imperfect as it has been, and we're two months into creating a program of online learning that has never existed in Ontario or in the country. And I built it up with incredible levels of opposition, but that is okay, and that's part of this journey of learning through the pandemic is you're going to be dealing with a significant amount of road, roadblocks. You do, I know all of you, deal with challenges every single day. How do we respond? How do we get back up? How do we confront the difficulty imposed on us by COVID? In the context of online learning, I never lost hope because I, going back to that STEM emphasis, I knew that if we get this right, if we build up a system, scale it up from 60,000 to almost 600,000 overnight, literally, we can be a global leader and certainly a national leader in this country that will provide credible, quality online learning. And so far, what I'm hearing is it has been um, well embraced by students with high standards of learning. We have ensured every educator in the province, I mandated it, every single teacher had to learn professional development, which I, which I uh, delivered and funded to teach online learning so that they understand how to do it best. I also expanded internet access. Every high school in the province of Ontario, in the most rural and remote parts of this massive frontier that is Ontario, every single province, every single community rather, uh, has access to internet in, within their schools, which is incredible. We, so we have internet in schools, sometimes it doesn't exist in the community. That's how advanced we have been and, and sort of surgical we've been in taking action to expand broadband. I've, and by next September, every elementary school will have internet, although, I'm pushing my team to get that done even sooner. We've expanded internet. We have obviously provided the online learning system. We've set a high standard. 75% of the day, uh, of an average day in a child's life must be live 
synchronous Zoom style learning. That's a high standard for context callings in El Quebec, in Manitoba, where they have pseudo online systems, nothing like ours at all. They do what we do in a day, in a week, when it comes to the hours or minutes of learning live. You can't even compare it. I mean, it's literally uh, a non-comparison given how much better off we are and how we are seen across the country as the gold standard of delivery of this system. And I'm assuring you, every single one of you watching tonight, that what you see today, you know, decent as it may be, it will be much better than what you saw in the spring. I'm showing you, I think hopefully we're building confidence that over time, we're gonna get this right. And since the spring to the fall, it's night and day. It is dramatically better. And I assure you by next winter and the spring, and obviously next September, you're gonna see dramatic improvements in the rollout of this system. So I really do believe that financial, that uh, STEM uh, technology, online learning, uh, our programs that while they didn't really exist in Ontario, we are pioneering it and we're getting it done. And I'm proud of that. What I'm also proud of is during this pandemic, yes, we're focusing on human health, but I'm also focused on the spaces that house our children. And I wanna make sure that we make a big dent of improving the spaces where your children learn. It is unconsciousable in the most prosperous, democracy, one of them certainly in the Western world, where we have schools that are in a state of disrepair. That is not acceptable. And the premier does not, does not want to see schools with significant um, maintenance backlog um, teaching our kids. And so during the pandemic, amid this crisis, twice I've announced two funding envelopes, each representing over half a billion dollars, $550 million twice once in the summer, once last week, to rebuild schools, to renovate schools, and to expand affordable childcare. I'm proud, as Ritesh will know, I, I made an announcement with my own, my own community uh, in Kleinberg based on the significant needs in Western Vaughan, but to be fair, in Etobicoke, in Scarborough, in Brampton, I uh, Mississauga, literally right across the province of Ontario, we have just been on a roll getting these projects out and, in, and encouraging our boards to get shovels in the ground. And so part of the pandemic is a realization that we can significantly improve the state of our schools, even while we deal with the urgent immediate challenge of keeping kids safe. We can do both and we are. And so these projects are underway uh, or will be underway in very short order. And I am proud to do that. Now, yesterday, just to build on the point of the physical spaces around it and how we're adapting and pivoting and really how we're ensuring that during this pandemic, we also ensure that our, our students are safe. We're not looking at this just from how are we gonna keep uh, students safe today? I mean, of course that's a priority. I'm also looking at it as per the mandate of tonight's speech, but a sort of a long-term analysis of how do we leverage opportunity and how do we drive positive change over time? And that's why uh, yesterday I joined the Premier of Ontario to announce a $700 million program for schools alone to be completed by December 31st, 2021, meaning time limited, it's urgent, it's quick, the shovel's got to get out of the, uh, uh, in the ground, and the project's got to get done by next year, by the end of next year, $700 million to improve airflow, to air quality, HVAC systems, uh, and, and do renovations to within our schools and child care. Why I'm saying this too is because even while we're seized with the daily challenge of COVID numbers rising and decreasing and you know, the risk being uh, uh, accelerating in some regions, particularly the GTA, I'm still not losing sight on what matters to you, which is that your child has a modern curriculum aligned to the labor market so that they can get a good job, they can get into good post-secondary to college, university, and the skilled trades, and that they can learn in modern, accessible, technologically connected learning spaces. And I'm proud to deliver that to the people of Ontario. Another part of this is recognizing the value uh, of positive mental health. And I just want to say that, you know, the pandemic has created many social impacts on all of us. I know, I know my colleague, Minister Michael Tabolo, I believe was, uh, has spoken at length, including with the Canada India Foundation recently, just about how important this is. I mean, it, from a human health perspective, it is compelling, as you all know. I mean, we're talking about our friends, our neighbors, our our loved ones, and these are not abstractions. I mean, I, I've seen it in my own family, both mental health and addiction, it is real and it is tough. 
But we have to make sure as a society, as much as we're focused on getting our economy back on track, we don't lose sight of the human impact of this pandemic. And in the Ministry of Education, there is per per perhaps nothing more important, nothing more relevant than the safety of your children and the mental health of your kids and our staff, to be quite frank. We, 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 want, we need all of them. I mean, we want all of them to feel respected and motivated. It's stressful. It's stressful on the children to see change, uh, to see disruption, to not see continuity in their lives. And so that's why in the pandemic earlier on and systematically throughout it, I have more than doubled the funding within mental health within our schools in the province of Ontario. And I'm so proud to deliver more than 100% net increase just in this pandemic to hire more psychologists and psychotherapists and social workers to ensure that children do not have to wait to get access to the mental health uh, practitioners they deserve. And I know mental health is important to many of you as well. It is important to me. Now, I come from an Italian family um, and sometimes there's a bit of a stigma attached with talking about it. And, but I think really, if there's a time to break the stigma, it's now at, a, uh, at an element of our, in our world where social isolation is so tough, especially on our seniors and our young people, on widows, on just on a lot of people around us that just need uh, an element of compassion. So I guess I challenge all of us, including myself, to do more of this and talk about it, to embrace the fact that it's real, it happened, it's okay. But how we get through it is by making sure that the services are around in our communities within our schools. And I have more than double the funding allocation because I really believe it's a real issue and it's something we can do to improve the lives of our, of our students. Improve the lives of our students, improve the productivity of our economy. There are so many measurements if we improve mental health that I think can really make a difference. The other thing I want to chat about is just the concept of ensuring childcare so critical we have to reimagine child care i mean we have seen in this recession a major impact on women uh denying in some respects the economic participation labor market participation of women within the job market because and often not exclusively but often they will stay home if the if the kids are home now that applies to some men as well of course as you know but that is a challenge we have made massive social gains as a society of enabling women and women entrepreneurs and uh, and, and, and workers to get into the labor market. They are highly skilled professionals. We can't go back. And so I've worked very hard on the child care file to make sure that child care is accessible and affordable for the people of this province. In the midst of this pandemic, I've personally approved over 1,700 net new child care spaces in the last seven months. Those are just the ones I'm building within our schools. We're also supporting independent expansion. And I really do believe this is critical because if we don't enable parents to return to work, we're going to have long term economic uh, impacts um, when it comes to our recovery. So we put in place emergency child care day one when the pandemic hit. I closed child care for the people of Ontario, but I kept it open for our frontline emergency workers, as you may remember. That was a lifeline for doctors and nurses uh, and for critical frontline staff, you know, uh, uh, firefighters and police officers. And so we did that because we knew it would be critical for them. Then we expanded it for everyday parents across the province. And of course, right now, 94 to 95% of all child care operators in the province of Ontario is open. And that doesn't happen by coincidence, pardon me. It happens because of a thoughtful plan that has been fully informed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. I. Um, I am just eternally grateful for the work that uh, is being done across the province. I'm proud to serve with our premier, serve with women and men who are committed to making a difference. And I also just want to say how proud I am to be a part, uh, to be in government at a time of leadership uh, when I know that the stakes are high. Being able to represent you, the voices of the Chem India Foundation, the voices of Canadians that are proud of our country, uh, and proud Indo-Canadians, that is what inspires me every single day without exception. Knowing the humble beginnings of my family, knowing the humble beginnings of your family, but also realizing the tremendous success and the contributions you make, it inspires me. And I mean, there's a lot, as I said off the top, a lot of challenges, a lot of darkness. You watch the news, it can be almost depressing. But let us never forget the strength that we have as a people 
um, when we stay united, when we stay uh, and we remain collaborative within our disposition to help each other, stand by each other uh, and get through this together. So I recognize that there is so much more to do uh, as we overcome difficulty, as we overcome challenge and adversity. But I've never been more proud of my citizenship, never been more proud to be a Canadian. And I'm proud to stand with you as people who make a difference, producers, doers, as my father would often remind me, people who came to this country to contribute. And I know some of my closest friends are Indo-Canadian. Um, we have shared values. I draw a lot of parallels from my Italian immigrant experiences of our parents and grandparents and the, the, the love we have for our elders, the respect we have for our aunties and uncles. Uh, but uh, what I would just simply say is thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your contribution, for your hard work. Thank you to the Canada Indian Foundation for your generosity. You've also been on the front lines with PPE delivery and food and just helping out in every way you can. And honestly, I'm proud of you and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I look forward to doing this in person with you and we can get back to normal in our country. But in the meantime, please stay safe. And thank you, uh, Ritesh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and of course, um, I just want to say, Satish, thank you for your leadership as well. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister, for your very, very insightful uh, remarks. And uh, we couldn't agree more uh, that these are very unprecedented, tough times. And during this time, uh, it not only uh, doubles up our energy to tackle all these challenges, but also expands our mind to uh, you know, find very innovative solutions where we can take a new chart, a new course uh, for the future generation. So Minister, I know we are pressed with some times and we have a lot many questions. Let's try that how many we can address with, with that uh, given shortage of time. So for the first one is that, <clears throat> Minister, what do you identify uh, the, single, the single biggest challenge uh, uh, looking at the COVID-19 situation, which uh, you know, education faces today? So what, 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 is, what, what is your thoughts on that? In education, yeah. I, I think the greatest threat we have within education is uh, that we, uh, I think really we exacerbate, we compound the gaps that exist within the education system. Meaning there were some young people that were falling behind in Ontario, right? That happens every year, regrettably. This pandemic may make it worse. And so we have to take a very careful, thoughtful approach to making sure that we lift these kids up, that we do not allow gaps, we do, that we don't leave children behind as a consequence of the pandemic. Now, remember, some families, uh, you know, they, they may not have the technology or the means um, as, as others may have. And so it's about realizing that difference that exists within Ontario and the duty of government to help to equalize their opportunity, give them equal opportunity to succeed. So my concern in part is surrounding making sure that some of those kids that have always faced challenges, that they don't uh, be lost in the cracks, if you will. Uh, but I also am very self-aware of it. I'm on it and we're taking action, particularly the actions we've taken to counter racism, racism against South Asians, against Black, against a variety of other people within our country that is absolutely unacceptable. And that's why during the pandemic, I initiated a major sweeping reform to deal with discrimination in our schools. In Peel Region, I commissioned a report where we saw anti-South anti, um, Asian, anti-Black, anti-racialized uh, actions being taken without any accountability. And I called, as you may know, I called in a supervisor the first time in Ontario history a supervisor was imposed on a board for non-financial reasons because the color of a child's skin should not be a barrier to their success. It's it, like we live in this, you know, we live in this country and, and often we came to this country to, to, free, to flee persecution and to seek opportunity. And so I am very much concerned about it, but at the same time, I'm very much focused on resolving it. And that's why I think we'll be able to actually over the coming years, improve the situation and not make it worse. Oh, thank you, Minister. Yes, so definitely we can't agree more that as we are marching ahead on, on this century, this is one of the key issues we have to continue uh, tackle it and do some kind of a path, path breaking, breaking initiative on that front. So any, uh, we know that government has announced uh, that uh, we need to work on improving the math, math score for the kids. 
So, and uh, that has uh, actually generated a lot of interest with many parents. And in the current context of COVID, uh, how do you see that implementing it? Yeah, you know, look, in this province, you know, and I say this, you know, I, I know you're a nonpartisan organization, but I'm the former government, you know, uh, uh, under former Premier Wynn and McGuinty, uh, students in Ontario, their math scores were plummeting. The majority of grade six math students can't pass or meet the provincial math average. What is going on? How is it possible? We are the envy of the world in education, yet kids can't pass basic math. We've moved away from basic numeracy skills. And so this government, and I, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, in the math curriculum, we unveiled a new math curriculum. We go back to basics, memorization. We understand the skill sets that are Your absolutely helpful. Please. Building helpful. personnel will be conducting tests of the fire alarm system. This Elevator is, operations should not be affected. This is the new world please of Zoom. Please disregard the alarm tones. Further announcements will be made to keep you advised. That's amazing. You can't make this up. Your so, attention, oh. please. Building personnel will be conducting tests of the fire alarm system. Elevator operations should not be affected. Please disregard the alarm tones. Further announcements will be made to keep you advised. Okay. Let's hope that's the last time that happens. But you know, this, this that's my version. I don't have kids. That's my version of like my baby running into the room. So it's okay. It happens to everyone. It may happen again. I'm sorry. Um, look, um, math. You were talking about math. So the math scores were the math scores were very low in the province of Ontario. I'm just going to keep talking through this. Uh, very, very low. Very problematic. And so we brought forth a new math curriculum that I think is going to materially improve math scores. I also mandated required all new educators in Ontario to be able to meet a grade nine math standard, meaning every new teacher in Ontario, that is an, I, don't, I don't care what you teach, you have to learn and have to be able to pass a math proficiency test Your attention, in please. order to teach a in the province of Ontario. Stand by for further instructions and prepare to evacuate the building. Sometimes you get to say that a fire alarm, like you get, it's a joke, you know, did you pull the fire alarm to get out of a, a, a press conference? In this case, there literally is one. So I think Sitesh, I'm gonna to have to probably go. Maybe just one last question. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have last question, uh, Minister. And uh, particularly, how do you plan to make, uh, you know, a lot of parents engagement is required, like, like whatever initiatives uh, being taken and future on the pipeline or in, in plan that how you are thinking of getting more and more parents in, included in some of those initiatives or discussions before yeah. before even proposing well, what's what's your thought on that absolutely i think the voices of parents the voices of parents are critical um i believe parents need to be heard i believe many of the reasons why we had governments make problems in education is because they weren't listening i to parents when they told me Your that they please. want the a best educator the at the front activated. of their child's class i listened to educators in the to province of ontario when we took action to abolish regulation 274 that's the regulation that puts seniority over merit that is so antithetical to the concept of merit i want the best teacher for the job you talk about listening to parents how many parents have told all of us and they're aware of educators being promoted, not based on merit, but because there's seniority in a union. And it, in this country, I believe what has to triumph, what has to drive promotion in hiring is listening to the voices of parents and taxpayers and common sense people by saying, no, this system isn't built for, 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 for unions. It's built for our kids and they deserve to be in the driver's seat, which is why I abolished that regulation as of midnight tonight, 12.01 that regulation will be relegated to history where it belongs. And we'll be able to return a system of hiring on merit. And I'm proud of that. I mean, honestly, that's probably one of the most profound changes we're gonna make in the system of education. And I listened to parents. They said to me, it's gonna to be tough. You're gonna to be opposed by the unions. You're gonna be you know, tarnished on social media. But I'm telling you, going back to the first principle, it's the right thing to do. And when it, when it comes to advancing parental perspectives, I'm not here to go along, to get along. I'm here to do what's right for them and their children. And that's why I don't apologize for making changes to a system that is static, 
that hasn't been updated probably throughout my entire life fundamentally, or not, not many updates. And that's why we're taking pretty significant action. The other thing is we're listening when it comes to making sure that our government actually, before we introduce this legislation or reform, that we get out there and talk to parents on the ground not an ivory tower approach like some parties where, you know, you listen to just one small constituency of the population. I want to listen to working people and have their values um, triumph, have their perspectives be shared and acted upon. And so parents' opinions matter. I ensured parental choice of online and in class. I ensured parental choice on the uh, sex education. I believe parents should be in the driver's seat of that. I mean, in each and every step. I ensured you are respected. And that's what this premier, Doug Ford, he really does believe that. He believes that in his heart that we've got to get, uh, we've got to better serve our parents and our students. And that's what I'm working to achieve. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And uh, one last question uh, before you go. Uh, I know we are pressed with the time and uh, uh, $15 billion budget in 2005. And today we are on 26 billion in education sector. Where do you see the future? Well, the question is, we're, I mean, we're spending a lot more in, in education. The question for parents is, do you see the result? We have never spent more money in public education, yet 80% over the past decade of monies that go into education is going to compensation and pay. The majority of money, 20 cents of the dollar actually trickles down to our children. The majority go to pay. Now, I'm not here in any way to discredit the incredibly hardworking educators who are working so hard right now. And I'm proud of our teachers and principals and administrators. They are, they're doing their very best. But I'm also here to say we spend more, but yet we have poor results when you measure it according to math, for example. So the future of education requires, yes, continued investment, but I think it requires a lens to our education act, our regulation and our policies for the first time, how to go through a student lens. What's right for children? Not what's right for the, you know, for, 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 for maybe the union, it's what's your right for our kids. And so our, our aim through this process is to make sure. And prepare to evacuate the building. Our aim through this process is to make sure that everything we do, every dollar we spend, gets put through a lens of, is this gonna help a child get ahead? Is this gonna help a child graduate? Is it gonna help a young person get access to a good paying job? If it doesn't answer those questions, then we ought not be spending that, your money, taxpayers' money. Uh, and so we're making significant reform in this respect, but it's an important question. I think it raises a really important question for all of us. We've never spent more and yet we're not getting good results. And so when I hear some people say, spend more, after spending the highest levels in Ontario history under this government, you start to think, is that, is that enough? And I think it's not just about the money, it's about the curriculum, it's about the hiring, it's about the quality of the educator that according to all research suggests could really dramatically improve the life of a child. So we're gonna to continue to do this and we're gonna do it aggressively, uh, working with the premier with all my colleagues, just to make sure that at the end of the day, I can look a parent in the eye and say, we did our best and the system under this government is serving you, our parents, our taxpayers, and our kids. And that's what I think fundamentally um, is what our kids deserve. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister. <clears throat> we know you're in the in the building. I think you better have to leave now. Uh, uh, they're going through some, some kind of testing. So want to, on behalf of Canada India Foundation, on all, uh, you know, Indo-Canadian want to extend a very, very sincere thank for taking time out to uh, join us and share, share your uh, views and we wish you a good health and well-being as you are marching ahead to steer this very difficult time for our, our kids. And we wish you all the very best and thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, all the friends for joining us and uh, uh, stay tuned for our uh, speaker series. And we have, as Minister touched upon on mental health, we are uh, working on our speaker series on Ayurveda. And we have been in discussion with the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction uh, to discuss some of the ways what our ancient wisdom, yoga and Ayurveda offers on that. And we'll be uh, discussing that uh, uh, further with the Minister of uh, Education as well, uh, that how we can uh, help uh, in, in that manner. And uh, stay tuned for our next speaker series, which is coming on Sunday. 
uh, this coming Sunday. And a special thanks to all of our media partners, in, including Y Media, Pravasi Media, and all other who have been uh, uh, live broadcasting our uh, sessions. And uh, uh, good night, wish you all the very best. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday and uh, future uh, of our speaker series. Thank you very much. There's no noise. So this is my one time to say goodbye. Have a great evening. Thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to see you, Ritesh. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Canada India Foundation, to all the supporters, all the media, everyone watching. Honestly, thank you for being just incredible people. And I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully soon. Um, and I'm just tremendously grateful for the opportunity to speak to you.